So this morning, I want to talk to you about the vocabulary of grace. Keep your Bibles open to Ephesians 2 and the verses that we've read this morning, uh, verses 1 through uh, 13, so that you can follow along with uh, the message of grace. So as we're talking about grace, um, Christianity has uh, been called the religion of grace. And that is true. We sing about grace. We write poems about grace. We name our churches and our children after grace. There are quite a lot of churches around us, in fact, that have a grace in their name. Grace Bible Church or Grace United Methodist Church or Grace Fellowship Church. We see this often in the use of the word grace. But for all of that, it seems that grace is not always well understood and often not really believed. It may be that we use the word, but we rarely think about what grace means. In fact, I would say that there's times in our lives when we think infrequently about God's grace. For every discussion we have about grace, we have a dozen discussions about the church budget or the church programs or maybe our favorite sports teams that are going to win in March Madness. We seem to talk a little bit more about some of the common ordinary things of life than we do grace. I suppose if I ask all of you this morning, if you believe in grace, you would say that you do. But often outside of our worship services, uh, we don't spend a lot of time just in our common, ordinary English talking about grace. But I believe that there are plenty of us who find reasons and ways to be reminded about the grace of God in our lives. Uh, we can never forget, we can never get over what God has done for us when he saves us from our sins, amen? We should never get past that. Uh, and we can say um, with the people of God and with the apostle Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And, and that's really true about all of us. So knowing that there are a lot of us that don't really think all that much or all that deeply about God's grace, um, I think it's good for us to, to talk about it. Um, and so my goal today for us in our study of Ephesians 2, so keep your Bibles open, is to help us to re-enshrine this uh, doctrine of grace in our hearts. And, and I want to say um, several things about the doctrine of grace, okay? First of all, let's talk about the need for grace. Why do we need grace? Because if you miss this, you miss everything. And maybe nothing else I say this morning uh, will really be understood unless you really understand the need for grace. Why all of us personally stand in desperate need of the grace of God. Why do we need God's grace? Well, the Bible makes it clear because all men and all women are by nature spiritually dead and separated from God. We have to begin at the basic starting point. We're talking a little bit of, if you will, theology this morning, a little theology lesson. So we start at the beginning. What is the foundation? And we find the foundation, if you have your Bibles open there, just looking back again at Ephesians 2, and the first three verses. Listen to what Paul says again. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. So that's our state. That's where we are. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Why do we need grace? 
because we have God's indictment of the entire human race apart from his grace. It's what he says about you and me as we stand before him in our natural condition of sin. And there are three things that Paul mentions that are true of us outside the grace of God. Verse one, he says, you are dead in your sins. That's your natural condition. If you don't experience the grace of God, you are dead in your sins. Verse two, he says, you are enslaved in your sins. You're bondage, you're in bondage to sin. You can't break yourself free. Free. And then thirdly, he says, not only are you dead in your sins, you're held bondage to your sins, but he says you are under the wrath of God. By our very nature of sin, dead, enslaved, we are subject to God's wrath, just like everyone else. And there cannot be a more helpless and hopeless condition. This is what God sees when he looks down on planet earth, he sees dead, enslaved, and under the wrath of God. Now, if we think about that just a moment and we think about being dead. How dead can we really be? Because none of us here this morning and people outside the walls of this church walking around don't look dead, do they? To our human eye, we look very, very much alive. But God says that apart from grace, all of us are dead. He's not talking about the physical life. He's talking about the spiritual life that's in us. We are dead apart from grace. There's something in everybody that causes us to think that we're basically good at heart. We're hearing a lot of this. Everybody's just fundamentally good. Everybody's just basically good. And it's easy to think that way. Especially when you consider all the murders or the rapists that are running loose in the world. Comparatively, when we look at our neighbor or our friend or maybe a family member, we think, well, as compared to them, they're a good person. We're not as bad as they are, are we? And we hope that God thinks the same as we do. But the Bible reminds us a very important thing that we need to remember. And that is that apart from grace, apart from the, the gift of God's grace to us, every one of us is individually, spiritually dead and rebellion against God, under God's judgment, guilty and unclean, and worthy of eternal damnation. We are not simply unworthy of heaven apart from God's grace. We are entirely worthy of hell and punishment. And it's what God says about a husband or a wife or a child or a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a neighbor or a friend or a classmate or a business associate. The Bible doesn't tell us that we are inherently good. <laughs> The reality is all of scripture tells us that we are inherently sinful. We are born in sin. We have a sinful nature within us and we are in bondage. We are in captive to that. We are enslaved to that. And unless we experience the life and the freedom and the grace that God gives, we are always held captive to that. Good works, kind deeds, Charitable giving, acts of kindness are nothing more than filthy rags in God's eyes. Our own righteousness, any righteousness that we think we have within us, within ourselves, any goodness. The Old Testament says your righteousness is like a filthy, dirty rag in a closet. You don't have any self-goodness. Anything that we have comes from God. And so we need God's grace because we're not as good as we think we are. In fact, what we say is 
without God's grace, without his love, without his forgiveness, any one of us is capable of doing the most dastardly evil known to man. Have you ever just seen the headlines in the newspaper and you wonder, how can somebody do that? Have you ever thought that? How somebody could be that despicable? And once in a while, in fact, very recently, we've had some despicable deeds that have hit the headlines that have come from people who had no criminal record. No criminal record. But something erupts within them, right? Some evil thing erupts within their heart and they strike out and they do some dastardly evil deed. And we sit back and say, how could they be like that? How could they have done that? Never having done anything like that before, how could they do that? You know why? Because inherently in each of us, there isn't any self-goodness. And so the Bible reminds us that by our very nature, because of that, our very nature that we're born with, we are subject to the wrath of God. God's wrath is upon us, just like everybody else. That's the need for grace. What about the meaning of grace? Well, we get to turn the corner a little bit, okay? So now look at Ephesians 2, verse 4. And I love this little word, but, B-U-T. So we have this picture in verses 1 through 3, right? But what does he say? But... So you're under God's wrath, but verse four, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. I love this turning point, don't you? He's saying, this is what you are outside of God's grace, under the wrath of God. This is what you are, but God is so merciful and he loves us so much that he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Circle three words in these two verses. Circle three words in these two verses. It's okay to write in your Bible, by the way. Does everybody know that? It's okay to do that. Or you can write it on a piece of paper. Circle these three words because they change all of our lives. Love, mercy, and grace. Those three words change you and they change me. Love is that in God which causes him to reach out to us in loving benevolence. Mercy is God withholding punishment. And grace, what is grace? Grace is the favor of God. So look at the contrast here. You're dead in sin. You're not lovable. Nobody will love you like that when you're in bondage to sin. But God loves you. And you're under the wrath of God. But God gives you mercy. He withholds his wrath. How many of you say that before you met Jesus Christ is your Savior, you'd say, yeah, if I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be here. Would you acknowledge that? If I got what I deserve, if you got what you deserve, but mercy, mercy, God withholds punishment. And grace, grace is favor, the favor of God. There isn't anything we did to deserve anything from God to deserve his favor, but unmerited favor, he gives that to us. So think of it this way. Imagine a vast reservoir of God's love. So here's this vast reservoir of God's love. And as it begins to flow toward us, it becomes a river of mercy. And as that river of mercy cascades down upon us, the mercy becomes a torrent of grace. I love that image, don't you? This reservoir of God's love, it flows towards us in a river of mercy. And when it reaches us, it cascades down over us in a torrent of grace. So love, mercy, and grace. Now, here's a good way to remember the difference between mercy and grace. Now, listen very carefully 
because it's a little play on words, okay? Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. What do we deserve? Judgment. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. What do we don't deserve? We don't deserve salvation, do we? So grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Did you catch the play on words? Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. And grace never goes up. It always comes down to us. God gives us what we don't deserve and what we could never earn. And there's two thoughts behind the truth of God's grace. One is you deserve I deserve eternal punishment for my sins. You do not deserve God's grace and you can never earn it by anything you say or do. You don't earn God's grace. He gives it to us. When he looks down upon us, he doesn't see our good deeds. He doesn't see our vaunted achievements. He doesn't see our fame or our wealth. God sees death. He sees death walking. And that leads us to an important truth is that God is not obliged to save anyone. He's not obligated to show his mercy. He's not obligated to forgive. God would be perfectly justified in letting the dead stay dead, wouldn't he? He could just say, well, that's the way you are. Just stay that way. But God doesn't do that. There's two words that are, go together that are key. It's called free grace. Because if grace isn't free, it isn't grace. If you have to pay for grace, if you have to work for it, if you have to do anything to earn it, it's not grace because it's not free. And that's why the Bible says here that it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Only by God's grace. Nothing you've done is because of what God has done for you. Well, that brings us to verses six through nine, the implications of grace. Now, we're gonna discover the effect. What effect does grace have on us? When, God, when God's grace comes to us, when his love, his mercy, when we receive that into our life and into our heart, what is the implication? What happens to us? What difference does it make? That's what he's talking about in verses six through nine. So let's look at it. Look at verse six. For he raised us from the dead. Now, does that mean he raised us physically from the dead? How many of you think that's what he means? No, he's talking about we're raised from spiritual deadness. We were dead in our sins. Now that we get this mercy, love, and grace of God, we get this new life in Christ. So we are raised from the death of our sins along with Christ, and he seats us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. Now, how can that be? We're sitting in church this morning. How can it be that we're sitting here, but the Bible tells us that we're seated with him in the heavenly realms. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. So God, verse seven, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by grace when you believe. You can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's workmanship. So what's he saying? Here's the effect. Three words, three things that have happened to us. Remember we said love, mercy, grace, three words. We said three words, dead, enslaved, and under the wrath of God. Now we get another three words. He says that we are raised with Christ. We're raised from the death of our sins. We are seated with Christ, and we are now saved. We've been delivered. He takes dead men and women, and he raises them. He takes enslaved 
men and women and he seats them with Christ in heaven. He takes condemned men and women and he saves them from judgment. So grace is God's answer, his total answer to the moral ruin of the human race. It's such a complete answer that nothing else could ever be added to it. Listen, here's what happens. Our judge becomes our savior. Without Christ, we are judged in our sins and with our sins, we are dead. We are under the wrath of God. He is our judge, but with grace, with love, with mercy, with forgiveness, what happens? We are now experiencing him, not as our judge, but as our savior. And there are several things that are implied by that. Salvation is the work of God. It's not, you didn't save yourself. God through Jesus Christ saved you. Starts with God, it continues with God, it ends with God, and anything that you do in response to God is what God has first done for you. That's the way we respond to him. And then a second observation is, as long as you trust in your own good works, you can never be saved. He says this, it's not anything you do. You can't take credit for this, verse eight. You can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. This is the gift of God's grace. It's given to you. And then, as I just mentioned, through grace, the judge becomes our savior. Which side would you rather be on? If you're standing before God, if you're standing before Jesus, which would you rather have him be? If you're standing before him and you're looking at him knowing that you need mercy, would you rather have him as your judge or as your savior? If you appeared in a court of law and the judge is sitting behind the bench, what are you hoping he'll be? or she'll be. You're hoping that they'll find a way to express mercy, extend mercy to be your savior, not to give you what you're justly due. So this truth of grace takes away fear. In fact, the Bible tells us there's no fear in love. Our fear is made perfect in love. Any fear that we have, it finds its completeness when we come to Christ, when we experience his love and his grace. This is what it's about. So we don't have to fear. We get this joy and boundless peace. That's why we sing. <laughs> That's why we praise. That's why we rejoice. Why would we do that? The reason we do is because we know we've experienced the grace of God. People who haven't experienced his love and forgiveness and grace, they can't sing these songs the same way we do. They may try, but they don't have it from their heart out, do they? It's not from the inside out. It's because we've experienced this. This is what we know. We know what God has brought us from and what he's saved us to. Well, that brings us then to the demands of grace. What does grace demand? Grace demands something in our life. If God has given us this grace, what does it demand? We'll look at verse 10. We are God's masterpiece. You're a masterpiece of God. Think of that. Go out of here, tell your husband, tell your wife, tell your grandchild, look at them and say, guess what? I'm a masterpiece. Now they're probably gonna believe that anyway because they married you. But just go out of here knowing that because God has saved you, he's given you his grace, you're a masterpiece. You're fashioned in God's hands. And he says, he's created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can what? What do we get to do now? We get to do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are saved by grace unto good works. We're not saved by our good works. We're saved by grace so that we can do good works. Grace is the source. Grace is the guarantee of our salvation. Whatever God starts, whatever he begins in us, he's going to finish. We're not saved because we hold on to God's hand, but only because his hand holds on to our tiny hand. He holds us as we hold him. Grace found us. Grace will keep us. 
grace will not let us go. God's grace is the heart of the Christian faith. It's the sum of our message. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. We're taken to heaven by grace. And throughout eternity, we can say as the song Amazing Grace says, do you remember the last verse? We've no less days to sing God's praise, what? Than when we first begun. What are we talking about? We're talking about the amazing grace of God. It keeps us, it keeps us throughout all eternity. What a, what a gift we've been given. Grace is God's gift to you, but you know it's like every other gift. What do you have to do to get the gift? You've got to receive it, don't you? You have to receive the gift. You have to be willing to take it. And that brings us to verse 13. Now. You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Don't you like that? We're no longer strangers, but we've been brought near to him through his blood, through his forgiveness, through his sacrifice. And that's gonna lead us right into Palm Sunday. Next week, we'll talk about the vocabulary of the cross, what that means to experience that blood of Christ giving us, offering us forgiveness. And for that, my friends, we can go from here rejoicing knowing we're God's masterpiece of grace. And we can sing the hymn as we're going to close with this morning, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. He died for us so that we could have this grace that he's given to us in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's stand together as we sing.